Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Hope everyone is doing well. Wonderful testimonies of God's goodness in all of our lives. And now it's time for our spiritual meal, his word for us today. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I thank you for the honor and privilege of being here to deliver your word to your flock today. Lord, there are just a few loaves and fishes unless you multiply it and make it live inside of us so i just surrender this word to you speak through me and let me not do anything on my own resources bring glory to your name in this house let your spirit bless us all in the name of jesus christ amen, amen. <clears throat> excuse me all right let's get started our opening verses galatians chapter 4 verses 1 through 7 now I say that an heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. And if you think about that, right, in the days of, of, in the biblical days, slaves were not just like what we think today, as we had in this country. Slaves were anybody who like was in debt to someone and they couldn't pay it, them and their families became slaves. So they had servants in houses, and when a child was growing up, they were kind of mixed in with all the servants. There was not a lot of, a, a child doesn't stand out too much. But is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Praise the Lord. And because you are sons, God has sent forth his, the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And Abba is Hebrew for father or daddy. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to delve into this today. We're going to look at the fact that God has brought us from slavery to royalty. Praise the Lord. The story and glory of our adoption. God is good. And I pray that all of us can see this more clearly by the time we get through this. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. So the word, let the word do its work. God is a house builder. Before anything else, this is one of the things God loves to do. And let's look at how in the word God builds houses and what he uses to build his house. First one, first example in Genesis chapter 50, verses 7 and 8, it says, So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as the what? The house of Joseph, his brothers and his father's house, only their little ones, their flocks and their herds, they left in the land of Goshen. So already we see there's a house here that God built. Now, was it an RV, a mobile home? I think we're going to see the house of Joseph doesn't talk about our physical house. It's talking about something else. Let's look at another example. Second Chronicles chapter 21, verse 7. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because the covenant of the covenant that he had made with David, since he had promised to give a lamp to him and his, to his sons forever. Amen. Well, we know if the house of David was a physical place, it all got destroyed. It all got destroyed by the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar came in and wiped out the whole place. But he would not destroy the house of David. Let's see if God reveals more of what the house is all about. Now, God is building his own house. As we saw, there's two types of house, two examples of houses. And so let's look at how God is building his own house in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. It says, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And there's a clue. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not be, obey the gospel of God? So if the house of God has something to do with us, then maybe the house of Joseph and the house of David had to do with people as well. 
Let's let the word show us. What are the building blocks of these houses that God is building? And his own house, as a matter of fact. I love to quote Psalm 127, verse 1, but the whole psalm, which is not too long, will reveal to us what the house is made of. Praise the Lord. Psalm 127, a song of ascents of Solomon. And verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, which he can also use the city as a term, the watchman stays awake in vain. Moving on to verse 2, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. He's giving us a clue as what the house is all about. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children's, uh, children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. That's a place where you put all the arrows and carry them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is building a house of heirs, of children, of family. That is the house of God. That is the house of Joseph. That is the house of David. It is a family. God is all about family. Praise the Lord. Let's see how he revealed himself. We know the Old Testament was always pointing to Jesus, always pointing to God in his ways. So uh, let's look at uh, through Adam. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 says, This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he created him in the likeness of God. Everything on earth is a physical manifestation, a copy of things in the spiritual. And so Adam being the one in the image of God himself, he made him that way and so that he could demonstrate this house building of children. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Amen. So if he made Adam to be, well, he created all this world, everything in it. And he says, I'm going to now put an avatar, a person that's going to represent me to, to be the one leading all this creation, naming all the animals. I sent all kinds of animals to him to be helpers, but none were worthy. So now he has children. That means God has children. Amen. Okay, let's see him reveal himself through Abraham, even though he was Abram at the time. In Genesis 15, verses 1 through 6, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliz Eliezer of Damascus? He doesn't have his own children. He's got servants, lots of them. We know that, that when we read the word, he was very wealthy and he treated his servants very well. He was a good man. And so he sees that unless he has his own child, it's going to go to someone else that's not of his blood, not of his, his, his offspring. So it's grieving Abram. Abram loves God and he's following him, but he, his burden is that he doesn't have his own child. Then Abram said, look, you've given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And that's, again, a servant. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Praise the Lord. Again, God is not just telling stories about people. God is revealing himself in these stories that he himself can create all these spiritual entities, angels and seraphim. But but he's looking for his own offspring, his own family, that he wants to build a house, a family that he can fellowship with and be blessed with. 
that's who God is, and that, that is what God does. Amen? He's a family man. Praise the Lord. We are sons by faith. We just heard about Abraham. Galatians chapter five, verses five, uh, chapter three, verses five through nine says, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Of course, the law doesn't get us anywhere but death. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, Therefore, know that only all those who are the uh, only those who are the faith are sons of Abraham. So we become part of the family because we have the faith because he gave us the faith. We are his offspring, just like Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. It wasn't about physical dna it was about those of the faith praise the lord so then those who are of the faith are blessed with believing abraham and becoming children of god praise the lord luke chapter 3 verses 7 and 8 jesus said to the multitudes that came up oh no this is uh, john the baptist i believe then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Amen. So it wasn't about the, the physical, and it was the, the true story is a spiritual kingdom, a spirit, God is spirit, and we are born of spirit, and we are his children in spirit, amen, yeah. we don't have some birthright based on what our, who our physical parents were, praise the Lord, now, sons do require discipline, without discipline, we, uh, we all just become like the ones who rebelled in heaven before, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 8, we read this quite often. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Here it is again. We are children of God. My sons, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons, as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Amen? That's why we don't have to be surprised by this fiery trial, which is about to try us as though something strange is happening to us. It's God's work. It means we're his. It means he's not leaving us out there comfortable until it's too late. He's transforming us, breaking us down, as we've talked about many times here, transforming us, causing us to learn obedience through our sufferings. He's teaching us his ways so that we can become mature sons and daughters and not just little children whining and crying and doing all the things that we want to do. Amen? Amen. That proves we're his children. Praise the Lord. What may that chastening look like? There's all kinds of way that God, ways that God chastens his children. It's always for our good. Luke 15, verses 11 through 24, a very familiar story. But now let's see it as God and us. He said, a certain man, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided them to, uh, to them his livelihood. He gave them everything ahead of time. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gl gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and despair and I perish with hunger? What is this story telling us? Is it about food and money or is it about a spiritual thing when God has already redeemed us and yet we decided our way was better than God's way? And we went and did it our way. And in that process, 
we start to break down and we start to lose all the blessings and we start to struggle and we don't understand what's happening to us. And all of a sudden we come to the revelation that with God, everything is there. Amen. Yeah. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. When we see the error of our ways and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like one of your hired servants. Now, this spoiled brat is now a humble son who understands his father knows best, and he's going to stick with him this time, And but he doesn't feel worthy to be his son anymore. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Or as Sister Joanna mentioned in the, uh, in the Chosen, where Mary comes back and feels like she's wasted. She went her own way and she, broke, she blew it, just like this son right here. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fat calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Amen. Yeah. That is how God sees us. God loves us, but sometimes he's going to have to let us learn by, the, by experience. We, you can't learn everything from a book. Sometimes he says, okay, you want to go your way. I'm going to let you go your way. And that chastening is what happens when we leave his protective co covering under his wings and we experience life without him again. And we come to our senses and we turn back and we are not treated as servants. We are his children and he is happy for us to come back to him. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We are children of God just like he is. But we have this old man. We've been talking about this for the past few weeks about the old man in us. We're born again. Uh, well, I think we got it right here. John chapter three, verses five and six. Jesus answered again, Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. We are not born again until we're born of the spirit. The spirit. The flesh body is of this earth. It's returning to the earth, the ruler of this world, and all of it will perish. But the one that is born in spirit is the child of God. Amen? Yeah. So this is another example of how I can visualize this. We were at first just in total darkness. Now we're born again, and spiritually we're just a baby. But there is still this flesh that's fully grown fully steeped into the ways of this world, way more powerful and stronger than this little spiritual child within us. It dominates. It's the one that directs unless God does this work in us. Amen? Amen. So we, that's why we, we, uh, the, we don't do the things we want to do and the things we don't want to do, those things we do because that flesh man is still there. But that old man, that flesh is a slave. What is a slave to? Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. Egypt represents the world and the ways of the world. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service which they made them serve was with rigor. They were under the law. Our flesh is under the law. Our flesh is trying to be good on its own and ends up stuck in addictions and all kinds of issues that are contrary to the ways of God. And so it fights against the spirit. It fights to do its way and be God itself. Amen? A slave to the law. Here it is. It'll say it in the word right here. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, put over, putting away lying, each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. 
Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil, because that's what the flesh does. The, the, the devil uses the flesh. God uses our spirit. Let him who stole steal no longer, but let, rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Amen. So those are fruits of the flesh. We see them in ourselves. And then we try in our flesh to get better, to be a better person, and we get stuck. Yeah. Or we even end up worse because we don't get it yet. That it's all about just seeing what he already sees in us and saying, God, I see it, and I know you don't want it, and I give it to you. We get a second witness. We get prayer, and he works in there, and he takes it out. Amen? Amen. This is God's work in us. It will always be his work. These giants in our land cannot come out unless he, he defeats them. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. But we, we got to let go of our own righteousness and our own power, trying to be God of our lives. John chapter 6, verse 33 said, It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The, works that I, the words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So we see here, when it talks about renewing our mind and growing in the spirit, how we feed that baby, that baby comes from the word, the word of God, whether it's the reading the word or rhema word or however God is doing it. It's God himself who, who needs to feed us. We need to, need to seek him or just ask him to, to feed us, to do this work in us. And he's going to feed our spirit. The flesh wants to feed itself by exposing itself to the world taking in the ways of the world, killing our spirit and strengthening our flesh. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, which is what our flesh wants, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through the word, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? For sure. When we get the word in us, then we all of a sudden, it's much easier to see the things in ourselves that don't line up with the word of God. And all there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's all about just seeing the truth and seeing what he shows us in ourselves and saying, no, I want this. So I give this to you. And he does the work. Praise the Lord. God will do the work. We've had a lot of this word in the, over the past few weeks, but I'm going to include it. Uh, Exodus chapter 17, verses 14 through 16. We started a sermon a few, maybe a month ago with this. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Amalek represents our flesh, the old man in us. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Amen. It doesn't say man will have war, war with Amalek. It says God will. As long as we try to fight, we lose. But if, when we give it to God, he wins. And he gets rid of that old man in us. Praise the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. If there's ever a whole word to hold on when you think that it's hopeless, it says, now may the God of peace himself, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. It doesn't say sanctify yourself completely. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Amen? Amen? It is not our responsibility to get right with God. We, he redeemed us. We are his children, and he, it's his responsibility. A child in, in the home is not responsible for becoming an a, a upstanding citizen. It is the parent's responsibility 
to discipline and train, train this child in the way it should go. Our Heavenly Father is the one who is responsible for making us in his image. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. The process. Now, those of you who have been us for a while, you're going to have to put up with my fancy art again because I have to do it. The process that God uses over and over and over again. He shows it in his word. What does it say at the beginning of the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. In other words, the whole earth was dark. There was nothing there. And then he said, let there be light. And then there was day and there was night. There was good, there was evil. And we see that experience on the earth that we live in today. But then in the book of Revelation, at the end of the Bible, it says, now there was a new heaven and a new earth, and there was no more need for the sun because the light of God was shining and there would be no more darkness. So we see God demonstrating his work here from darkness. He brings it to the middle part where there's a balance. And then he brings it to full light where there's no more sorrow, suffering, darkness, evil, or anything like that. So he did it with the earth. Then we know the Israelites, they were in Egypt. Uh, they were just under the bondage of, of the, the Pharaoh, and they had no way out, nothing they could do. They cried out to God. God heard their cry, and he sent Moses, and Moses delivered them out of there. They were in the wilderness, and they had victories, and they had failures. They had wins and losses, and they were struggling. But he said there's a promised land, a plant land flowing with milk and honey where everything would be provided, and they needed to get to that promised land. Many didn't believe and they didn't make it, but their next generation did. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's look at the disciples who were just fishermen and tax collectors, just living life. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, follow me. And all of a sudden, now they have the, the light. They can he see the truth. They can hear the truth. They can cast out demons and heal the sick, but they also have failings. They couldn't cast out this one because they didn't have enough faith. They didn't have enough faith that he would get them to the other side of the the, uh, the water. And also they didn't, they couldn't even stay awake to, to pray when in the garden. And they they all just they left him too. It was good and evil, light and darkness, the struggle of the wilderness journey. But then came the upper room in the book of Acts. And all of a sudden, those weak, uncapable fishermen, tax collectors. First sermon ever given, 3,000 people got saved. No more struggles, no more falling asleep, none of those things. They walk with God the way Jesus walked with God in the power, the might, and the peace that comes from knowing you're with him at all times. Amen? Amen. And so, brothers and sisters, this is his story for us as well. We were once walking in darkness. We were sons of the ruler of this world, doomed for destruction. And then we heard the truth, and we too said we cried out and he answered our cry and he delivered us into this wilderness journey of where we are today where we have victories and power and we have struggles in our flesh and we have we have it's this mixed bag that uh, that's going on the flesh and the spirit in us but god is telling us that he is he who began the work will finish it and we too can be like those apostles of those days before where he will get rid of that old man in us and we will be free to walk with him without any reservation, rest from our enemies, and so forth. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. We don't have to wait till we get six feet under to experience heaven on earth. He's bringing it. He's bringing us to the promised land because he's going to do it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. He says over and over in the Bible, be fruitful and multiply. Of course, in the Old Testament, it was about having children and populating the earth. But, of course, for him and for us, it's all about being fruitful in a spiritual family. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it says, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await, wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin, for salvation get this what happened jesus died on the cross and rose again and then for 40 days he revealed himself to 500 other people 500 people he came and they saw him a second time that must mean and he they said why are you not going to reveal yourself to the world it's because 
He's got to do this work in the people that he prepares, and then he reveals himself to them, and then they reveal him to the world, of, and they go through the same process. So it's a work that God does, a sanctifying work, and he's getting rid of the old man in us. The old man has to go, and when he's done, the new man, the born-again person, will be able to see him for who he is and experience salvation on earth not just after we leave this planet. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we are children of God. If we didn't have this desire to follow God, we would not be his children. It's impossible because the flesh doesn't want anything to do with God. But the fact that we pursue, we want the things of the kingdom of God prove that we're his. But there is, it's through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of heaven. It's just part of the work. Amen. Amen. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of that which shall be revealed in us. We're not talking about going to paradise like the guy next to him on the cross. Here, the glory will be revealed in us. Praise the Lord. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. It's the children of God that the creation is waiting to see. It's the birth, the complete training and sanctification of those that God is going to use in the days ahead. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen? Amen. We are not hired servants. We are his children. He just wants us to believe him and surrender everything to him. And he is going to do it one way or the other. We either go easy, we go hard, but he's going to do it. Praise the Lord. All right, break. A couple of days ago, I already had this concept about servants or sons, servants or sons. And then all of a sudden, God gave me this dream. And yeah, it was like two nights ago. And I have to share it. I know he wants me to share it. It's as if I was remembering it was me or not, I don't know. It was just experiencing life before God called me. And, and, and so, or a person. And that is, when we don't have God, we are, um, we're free to be under, like, well, just live, right? We do what we want. We're going to do what feels good. But, of course, we have the, the law of the land, but we can only do what they say, otherwise we get thrown in jail. But we were just doing what we wanted to do. That was kind of a freedom in itself, but it was dead in the spirit just satisfying the old man do whatever feels good i want to get rich i want to uh backpack i want whatever it is i want to do uh some kind of drug whatever it was just you're free to do it with the with the restrictions of the law of the land we were just walking around doing our thing then all of a sudden god calls us and we recognize the truth and all of a sudden we see oh no uh, this is not the way now, I know because God's put his law in my heart. I want to, I want to honor God. I want to please him. And I, I want to be a good, good person now. It's changed. But then we have that battle going on within us. And there's that struggle, that light and darkness. And we start to get really locked up from because of this battle that's within us, this struggle that goes on and on. And we all the things we think about. But then he also let me see what happens next. And from the struggle and the religiosity and all the things that we try to be is self-righteous and everything else. When he finishes that work, guess what? We are free again. We're free again. That light, that third thing, I, I got to see it in the dream. I got to see that there was no religiosity. There was no certain expectation of behaving a certain way. I was free to do. But guess what? I had a different heart now. There was no worry about me doing the other things because the old man was gone. I was free to love. I was free to serve. I was free. I was free. No expectations. Just walking with God. Totally free. We, 
we had it that way with our flesh, but we're going to have it that way in the spirit. It's not about doing or whatever. It's just when he's finished, we're literally just being in his image on the earth and celebrating and serving and maybe praying for people and serving people and may be just living life however he wants us to live it. But we're a new person now. We don't have to worry about falling anymore because he will have gotten rid of all of that. I, I can't visualize this in pictures or anything else except one thing caught my mind. One thing I remembered and I was reminded of. Oh, well, before I get to that, this is, I had the dream and then I realized that God showed me that this was described right here in Ephesians chapter two verses 1 through 10. It's a description of what I saw in the dream. It says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were living free, but we were really dead and we were doomed. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience among whom we also, we once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, the old man fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as the others this is why we don't point fingers because we were once there it's like somebody who quit smoking and then pointing it at some other people who smoke you can't do that we got to pray for them so they too can be redeemed because they have no clue they need the truth so we were once walking around in freedom thinking that this is life do what i gotta do have a happy life hope i can live to 120 well, some of us did. So, but that wasn't it. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in, with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We became a part of the heavenly family, except the old man doesn't, doesn't want to, Accept that the new man is a child of God already living in the spiritual world, but this flesh keeps getting in the way and we look for the redemption of that flesh. That in the ages to come that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, so we can't stop trying to be good. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's not telling us you better walk in them. He's saying, I'm going to cause you to walk in them. That's what he's going to do. He just wants us to believe. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. It's all his plan. We are his children and he loves us and he's going to use us. We are free. Those good works that he prepared are just going to flow out of us. It won't be a struggle. It won't be a sacrifice. It'll just be natural. We will walk in freedom doing the things of the kingdom instead of the things of this earth. Praise the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 6, 36, verses 33 through 38. Again, I read a lot of this before. This is the end of it. Thus says the Lord God on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities. That's getting rid of that old man in us. I will also enable you to dwell in the cities that the ruins shall be rebuilt. Those ruins are what we tried to do in our works and the enemy came and destroyed. All the struggle, everything else was left nothing but ruins. But then he's going to pick us up. He's going to clean us off. He's going to rebuild the cities. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by where are the signs and wonders and all the wonderful things we saw at the beginning they're all gone but god is going to do it he's going to fill it so they will say this land that was desolate has to become like the garden of eden in a spiritual sense and the wasted desolate and ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited a city on a hill that cannot be hidden then the nations which are left and all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel 
his spiritual children inquire of me to do this for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like a flock offered as holy sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem on its feast days, so that the ruined cities will be filled with flocks of men. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Amen. Until we get broken from trying to be righteous, to try to fix anything, to, trying to be God, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, knowing if they ate from that, they would be like God. We will know, no shadow of a doubt, that there is one God, and we are blessed to be his children, but he is the one who does everything. That's why Jesus said, the things I do, I can do nothing of my own, but what I hear from my father is what I do. That's who we will be. We will do what we hear from our father. Amen. Yeah. He will be the head. He's not going to have two heads. He is the head. Amen. Well, there's a God head, but that's another story. Anyway, <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. When I was thinking about that freedom that we're going to experience when we really get it, when we think about when we see him for who he is and know who we are and the old man is gone, I had this remembrance of David in 2 Samuel 6. David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. And so David was celebrating. He was really rejoicing. And we are going to celebrate and rejoice. So I, I found a drawing that probably is uh, might help here. Here's David and the ark when he was bringing it back. In other words, God is moving into our temple. God is going to reside there, and we are going to celebrate. And it's not about being all certain behavior and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be a joyful freedom time for each and every one of us. We will be free to rejoice. Amen? Amen. Maybe today it might look something more like this. Maybe this is how we would see. But maybe, well, hold on. They're not wearing the right clothes and they're not doing the right thing. But no, this is the experience of being set free from the old man, set free from the law and all those things. And knowing that we are children of the most high God and that we don't have to try to be good because he has done the work in us. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. But let's read on to that story, that same story. He was dancing like that. And all of a sudden it says, now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through the a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Jump. Maybe this was her expectation of what a holy person should look like. Maybe this is the image of God that everybody wants to uh, think that God looks like. Oh, wearing the right clothes and being a certain way and oh my goodness. But where is love? Where is joy? Where is all the things that God promises for us? None of that. There's no freedom in that. It's all locked up. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not accusing. I'm, I'm just believing what I believe God is showing me. Is that we are free. We are his children. And, we, and we, when we walk in the spirit, we don't do bad things. We do all the good things in his image because that's who he is. He has a personality. He has a sense of humor. He is free and we are free. Amen. Amen. So what happens to the one who judged him, who was so despised his uh, ungodly behavior and their opinion? It says in verse 20, David turned returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly, shamelessly uncovers himself. In other words, like a drunkard or something like that. Mm -hmm. So David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me as he has chosen us. Instead of your father, the one of the flesh and all his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. Amen? Amen. And I will be even more undignified than this and will humble be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants of which you have spoken, by them I will be held in honor. Amen? Praise the Lord. Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. 
It's a story of a mindset. If, we, if we're set on becoming a religious, super religious pattern of what the world says religious looks like, it doesn't produce fruit. It doesn't produce people coming to God. And just like, oh, that's a holy person, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But it's when, when someone shows love in the midst of persecution, when we, we expect them to fight back, and they're full of joy and patience mm -hmm. and love and all the fruit of the Spirit, that is when we say, what does that person have that I don't have? And that's what gets our attention and draws us to Christ. Amen? Amen. Because they have that testimony. Praise the Lord. All right, we are called to become spiritual fathers and mothers. You know, I, I, I love these verses. I can't get away from them. First John chapter 2, verse 14a, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was made flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. To know him is not to hear about him or read about him, but to have that encounter with him. Amen? Amen. Yeah. No longer, Jesus tells the disciples at the end of their journey, at the end of all the training that they were given, all the struggles and all the failures, as we go through in our wilderness journey, we will hear these words as well. No longer do I call you servants. Yes, we serve God, but we are children who serve God, not hired servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. We think we know, but we don't really know. But I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. This is how we get sanctified. When he reveals all the things that we need to have in us, and we are transformed. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Let's wrap it up. John chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. It says, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. You see, it's about knowing him. We know the Father, we know God is real, but to know Jesus, to know the Word intimately, to have that encounter with Him is what we're all looking for. He came to His own, and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It was his will. It was his calling us that we responded to. It was him. It's his love. His, uh, he wants his children. He wants his children. And so he, he calls us and he calls us not wanting anyone to perish. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. John chapter 8, verse 31 through 35. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen? That's our logo, right? It's ultimately he's bringing us to the truth that's going to bring us to this place that once we were like that in the world in our flesh, we will again be free, free of all this rules, regulations, and all that stuff. Free to be ourselves because we won't be the same person we once were. Praise the Lord. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say we will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. As long as the flesh is there, it's going to do those things and we're slaves to it until we give it to God and he takes it away from us. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son, a daughter abides forever amen and finally ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 through 22 now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of god not you will be you already are this flesh thing that's bothering you god is going to get rid of that thing you are already his child you are his son and daughter having built, uh, been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the firstborn among many. He is the beginning of the family of God, and he is the cornerstone in whom the whole building, the house of God, 
being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Amen? Amen. Can a brick make itself? Can a brick place itself? No, the builder is going to do it. He began the good work. He's shaping us. He's making us fit exactly where he wants us to be. We are in his house. We are his family. No one will take us away from him. No one will snatch us out of his hand. It's not based on our goodness. If we're good enough, a brick can't be good enough. It can only be shaped, clean, painted, whatever, by the one who's building it. And we can rest in that and trust that we, too, will be free in the days ahead. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this word today. We pray, Lord, that you help these seeds that you're planting in our hearts and our minds. Water them, Lord, and give us the revelation that we're already redeemed and you're just taking us through school you're training us up in the way we should go and it's not about how good we can be but it's only how good you are and that you who began this good work in us will complete it we look forward to the promised land we do not care about the giants we see in there the, there is nothing you cannot overcome you will overcome every addiction every part of our personality that bothers us because we know it's wrong and then you will also show us the things that we may think are right, but not are, but are not, and just cause us to surrender them to you, agree with you, so that you keep your work and we don't have to keep going into the fire over and over again until we get it. Give us the revelation, Lord, and we thank you for being a part of your eternal family now and forever in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. For everyone here, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all. Amen.